Hey, it's Phil from Euroheat, and today I want to give you the five most common mistakes that people make when installing hydronic floor heating in a screed. So screeds are really popular now, as they should be. Uh, they weren't popular for a long time because people thought, you know, why, why the hell should we do this? You know, it's more complication, more cost. Why don't we just stick the pipes into the concrete slab? And this is the only way it's done in Europe because this separates the heating from the rest of the structure and the ground and wherever else the energy may escape. So a screed system done properly is completely insulated. It's sort of like, imagine an esky, and then there's a floor heating system at the base. And of course, on the base of the esky, there's insulation as well. And so that means that all of the heat that you put into the house stays in the house. It's not gonna just disappear into the ground, into the concrete and spread outside and, and be lost. And that costs you money if that does happen. So in Europe, they only use this method. And while we recommend this method, uh, ideally everyone would have it, it's not always the most economical option or the best financial option. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but right now I wanna dive into the mistakes. So the first thing is we often see screeds where there's no insulation. There's just pipe on top of say the concrete slab and then more concrete or a sand cement mix is put over the top and people consider that a screed. But when you do that, you're actually just increasing the thickness of the slab pretty much. It's all one bonded big thermal mass. And it doesn't really make sense because you could have just put the pipes into that slab in the first place. Sure, it wouldn't have worked as well, but you would have saved a little bit of money and time probably doing it that way. So uh, a, slab, a screed, an insulated floor heating screed, or floor heating screed should always be insulated. The next mistake is people do start insulating, but then they don't insulate everywhere. So for example here, you can see there's a, uh, some spray painting lines in the middle of the room there and there's pipes missing. And so that is an island bench. And what we often see is that people leave out the insulation underneath the island bench, for example, or underneath cupboards or on the sides of rooms. And there's a few problems with that. One is that the, the, the screed then that is poured over will then bond to the concrete underneath. So there's a, a connection. And that's bad for two reasons. One is that um, the bonded part of the screed doesn't want to move at all, whereas the part on the insulation, the screed on the insulation, wants to move a little bit because it can, because it's got this insulation sort of separating it. So then you have this unequal behavior of the screed. It's sort of stuck to the underlying slab in one section, but then it's free to move in another section. And that's where you get cracks and all sorts of problems. Now you also get thermal bridging through that. So that means that, uh, sure, there might not be any pipes there, but the screed will, the energy will um, heat up the, the screed a little bit underneath the island bench, and that energy will flow into the, the screed, uh, into the slab below. So if it's done properly, everything should be insulated and the screed should be completely floating. So not touching anything, and it should just live in its own little universe, sort of like in that esky, like we talked about earlier. So right now I'm out at a project in Shenton Park in Western Australia. Everyone else has gone home for the day, but I'm still working. <laughs> and what you can see is the team has installed the thermal insulation on top of the suspended slab. There's perimeter insulation all around, even around the column there and the pipe risers for the island bench there. And this perimeter insulation is quite important too. So that absorbs, that allows the screed to expand when it heats up a little bit and contract again and, and sort of move freely. And what this prevents is cracking from happening. Because imagine if the, that insulation wasn't there and that screed heats up just a little bit and expands just a little bit, it's got nowhere to move. So basically something's got to give either you know, the walls have to give, but they're not going to because they're pretty solid. So usually what gives is then the screed if it's not prepared properly and it can buckle or crack. Uh, so that's a really important consideration. So here we've got 20 millimeter insulation. Actually, I've got some here. So there's 20 millimeter insulation on top of the uh, suspended slab below. And we've got the floor heating pipe, which is stapled over the top. 
Now over this will be the 40 millimeters of screed and then there's going to be uh, a 15 millimeter stone tile with about five millimeters of glue. So that's a total build up of about 80 millimeters. So screeds can be actually thicker than this 40 millimeters and the overall build up can be pretty much customized. They can even be a little bit thinner. Let's say you can go down to 35, 30 millimeters with special designs of the screed. We find that for these low profile screeds, the 40 millimeter screed with the 20 millimeter insulation works quite well. Uh, and then you tend to go thicker after that. So for lower quality screeds, say a sand cement screed, usually you need thicker. So it needs to be, let's say 65, 70 millimeters thick, just so that uh, the, the screed itself has the strength to be able to ma uh, maintain its integrity under various loads and conditions in the house. But here, because we have this engineered liquid screed, it's really strong, it's really tough, we can get away with 40. Now, the catch with that is, it is, of course, a little bit more expensive than the sand cement screed, but uh, we find that a lot of people go for this option because they wanna save, they wanna minimize the installation height because they wanna maximize the height in the rooms. And these days with the smaller building envelopes and restrictions, you know, every centimeter really counts. So is there a right thickness and a wrong thickness for the screeds? Well, some of the problems that we see with screeds are they are either too thick or too thin. And it's sort of like, uh, I guess now that I'm speaking about it out loud, it's sort of like a Goldilocks situation where Sure, you know, it's still going to sort of work if it's too thick, but then there's all sorts of implications. You know, the structural engineer is not going to be happy because you're, you're weighing and like, you know, putting extra dead load on his structure. So he has to make his concrete thicker, which ends up costing you more money. If you make it too thin, it might not have the right integrity. So it might crack when you're moving furniture in. It might not make it, you know, it might be cracked by the time you've, you've moved in. But sort of somewhere in the middle is that Goldilocks zone and different products and different requirements mean that um, no one, one sort of screed type is correct. So the fifth most common problem that we see with screeds are no expansion joints or not enough expansion joints. And expansion joints often get confused with construction joints. Construction joints are a little bit different where they're often just cut into concrete afterwards to influence where the concrete is going to crack um, sort of discreetly underneath the cut line while it's curing and, and shrinking a little bit. But expansion joints are different where it's a, because the screed continually moves when it heats up and cools down and it doesn't move much. We're talking, you know, can be fractions of a millimeter or a couple of millimeters a maximum, obviously depending on the, the base sizes or um, the area that's covered. But if you don't allow for this expansion and contraction, you will end up again with say buckling or cracking, problems like that. And the reason is, let's say you've got two, two um, heated screeds next to each other. And if you made a construction joint in the middle where let's say they just cut a line in the top just to make the, the line neat and then it cracks by itself underneath. These are now two sort of separate entities. And when they heat up, they will push into each other a little bit and then they've got nowhere to go. So they will just, you know, probably buckle or pop up a bit. And you, you know, you'll notice that because you either see it physically that say one might rise or they both rise and there's a bit of a hill in the, in the room. Um, or you might notice when you start walking over it that it doesn't feel right or, you know, it feels like there's a bit of a hill there. And at that point it's too late because everything's done and, Basically, to fix that, you need to rip the whole floor up and start again. So an expansion joint in contrast, let's say you've got those two screeds again, instead of just having a cut line, a neat cut line in the middle, which um, then influences where the concrete cracks underneath, there's a uh, expansion joint, which is like a, uh, can be a 10 millimeter foam profile, and that lives there forever. So that gets put in, and then the screeds get cast in against it. And that foam has some compressibility. It's, it's similar to the foam that I was talking about before, which runs around the side of the, the screed. And so that means that when those screeds heat up and they push into each other, that foam absorbs that expansion. And it means that they're both still happy. There's no, there's no movement up or down or you know, tension, cracking, any sort of problems. And now you're probably thinking, 
geez, there's a big, ugly, you know, foam strip in the middle of my room, right? Usually what happens is it gets uh, worked in so that it matches, let's say, the tile joints, if you have tiles over the top. And then there's, say, a three millimeter sort of um, gap made between the tiles, and that's filled with a flexible mastic which matches the grout color. So there is some flexibility there, it can still move, but visually it looks pretty much the same as everything else. Now, to be honest, some people are, uh, pretty upset when they see them after it's installed because when there's no furniture in the room and everything's bare Sure, you walk into the room and you notice it But I guarantee you that after you know this the rooms full of furniture and you move in You don't see it because it just blends in with everything else So don't be scared of the expansion joints. They will actually save you a lot of headaches in the future Now how many of these expansion joints do I need? Well, usually they're put through doorways because that's a sort of natural restriction point, like a neck. Um, so if we didn't put expansion joints in there, you, we would find over time that the floor finish or the screed would crack there. So that's the first place. And usually they're hidden directly under the middle of the door so that if the door's closed, you don't see it. Uh, in larger rooms, you might need one in the middle of the room. Now, we don't need one here in this room because of the dimensions and the screed that we're using. So different screeds have different um, characteristics and how they perform with you know, their expansion and contraction. So for example, a sand cement screed, which is a really simple screed, and you know, a tile, just any old tiler can mix up a sand cement screed. They do that every day. That isn't as good as um, holding itself together and maintaining its integrity when it expands and contracts. So they need to have small base sizes, smaller base sizes than this, for example. Uh, here, we, because we're using this liquid engineered product that is really strong, we can cover this whole area and only through those doorways, the three doorways behind me, are there expansion joints here. So I've told you about the five most common mistakes that we see with floor heating screeds. And there's actually a lot of other problems that happen. Uh, you know, I could stand here for another hour and I probably wouldn't even be finished with all of the problems. But it doesn't mean that you should be scared of screeds. Screeds are great. They've been installed for decades and decades and decades uh, in Europe and even in Australia. We at Euroheat um, Australia have been installing heated screeds or heated and cooled screeds for over 30 years. And we've got a 100% success rate. And the reason is that we take care um, and make sure that all of the small details are right. We know, we understand how the screed performs, the characteristics, what happens if the sun shines on it and you know, it's cooling. You know, we, we understand all of the, the little bits and pieces, how it should be put together, what can go wrong. And that's how we can have a good success rate. So I encourage you, if you're looking to have a heated, uh, or a floor heating screed in your house to make sure that your contractor has quite a lot of experience I'd say at least say 10 to 15 years of experience with screeds floating floor screeds in particular and uh, just to make sure that they know what to look for and you're not going to end up with a nightmare later and everyone pointing fingers and people disappearing and you're left with the mess and if you did want some uh, specific help with this, please do give us a call at Euroheat Australia. We'd love to help you with your floating floor screed.